What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. I hope you're all having a great day wherever you are. As always, if you are enjoying our channel, please hit the like button and make sure you subscribe so you never miss a show. And subscribing is important. We're almost at 2,000 subs, and I've got a big-time giveaway. I'm going to keep talking about it every time I do a video. When we get to 2,000 subs, I'm going to pick one lucky sub and give them $250. So it's important. The quicker you get us to 2,000, the quicker we do the giveaway. So make sure you subscribe if you're new around here. If you enjoy it, tell your friends. Get them to subscribe as well. Let's get into another interesting mob topic. Um, we're going to talk today about a guy that doesn't get the credit, but we can credit him for really being the eyes, the ears, the confidant of really one of the biggest legends in the history of the mafia. When we bring up Vincent Giganti, we can talk about his illustrious mob career. When we talk about mob Mount Rushmore's, Vincent Giganti may very well be on that. He was a clandestine lunatic, but he played the game the right way. And there's not many people that helped him more throughout his career and quiet Dominic Cirillo. We're going to talk about him today on the show. We're going to talk about a very interesting life, one of which where he cultivated a friendship with Vincent Giganti very early. and He would be the closest confidant the chin would have as he rose to the head of the biggest crime family in America. Quiet Dominic Cirillo was born July 4th, 1929 in East Harlem. He was the son of Colombo Capo Alphonse Cirillo. Now, Cirillo, the elder, uh, would come up in the Profaci wing of the family, and he was very close with future family boss Joe Magliaccio. Now, in the early 60s, as we know, there was a younger faction of the Colombo crime family uh, called the Gallows. The Gallows were mentored by an individual called Frank Abadamarco. Now, Joe Profaci decides I'm going to whack about a Marco. The gallows are furious. They want retribution. They start going to war by kidnapping members of the Colombo crime family, including Joe Magliaccio. Now, as we know, uh, the Profaci wing starts hitting back. Um, they allow and, and create kind of a, a tentacle in a snaky Carmine Persico. Persico sets up Larry Gallo, a member of the Gallo brother group, to come to a Brooklyn bar to discuss some money-making schemes. At that point, they attempt to choke uh, Larry Gallo to death. Uh, one of the individuals that night in that bar was Dom Cirillo's father, Alphonse Cirillo. Now, ultimately, Larry Gallo got lucky. A police officer walked in, and the attempt was thwarted. Um, but later in life, uh, Joe Valachi would actually bring up Alphonse Cirillo in the Valachi papers. Uh, and the elder Falachi died in the 60s. Now, his son Dominic was obviously around uh, his father. He was around mob life. And living in Harlem, you can't really escape it during that time. Dom Shirley would come up as a boxer. Uh, and that's where he would meet Vincent Giganti at a young age. Um, now, as we know, Vincent Giganti was a very accomplished boxer. Uh, he would actually at one point even fight at Madison Square Garden. However, his friend Dom Cirillo wasn't as good a fighter. That's not to say he wasn't a tough motherfucker, though, because he was. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it was said Dom Cirillo actually was 0-3, and, uh, and he only fought about 16 rounds. Um, but he would make very good connections. And we can probably credit his boxing ring and, and his life in boxing to really being the thing that set him uh, up for the future and getting close to Vincent Giganti. Now, throughout the 40s, as we know, in the Luciano crime family, uh, Genovese was coming up. He was selling a lot of drugs, um, and Dom Cirillo slotted right in in the drug trade. He was actually a big-time heroin wholesaler. And at one point in the late 40s, it was estimated that Dom Cirillo was involved in a heroin ring that was bringing in about $100,000 a week. Now, remember, Okay, he's wholesaling it. And this is in the late, early, early, uh, late 40s, early 50s. Absolutely incredible money nowadays. In 1952, Dominic Cirillo would be indicted, though. Uh, and this would actually be one of the largest heroin seizures in the history of New York at that time. Uh, Dom Cirillo would get off with a pretty good sentence, though, just four years in federal prison. Now, upon his release, as we know, he goes back and gets in touch with his uh, old friend, Vincent Giganti, who's making his way 
in the Genovese crime family. We know that he attempts to hit Frank Costello. That doesn't work. Uh, but he is a, a guy that gets a lot of respect and starts to create his own career. As we know, also, Vince Giganti would take over the Greenwich Village crew and become a cop. Now, one of his most trusted lieutenants uh, was quiet Dom Cirillo. Throughout the 60s, they would continue thick as thieves running uh, Greenwich Village and really amassing a ton of wealth for the Genovese crime family. Benny the Squint Lombardo would take over in 1969 uh, and would reign throughout the 70s. But as the 70s continued to percolate, Vincent Giganti was getting more and more powerful. And he was setting up this very clandestine operation and ultimately was going to become the boss. But he needed confidentiality. He needed secretive people. And Dom Cirillo slotted right in as his messenger, his ear to the streets. If you needed to get to Giganti, you had to go through Dominic Cirillo. Now, um, in 1981, Giganti would take over as the boss, and he would, as we know, slot in Tony Salerno as the front boss, and he would maintain his anonymity and would create his lunatic uh, operation where he would walk the streets. But we all know he was all doing business behind the scenes, and Dom Cirillo would act as the man. Now, throughout the 90s, uh, Vincent Giganti was the head of a huge criminal enterprise in 1997, he would be indicted though and ultimately go to prison um, and would eventually get a life sentence. In 97, he would um, basically put uh, his old friend, Quiet Dom, in control of the family. It wouldn't last long though. Dom Cirillo only was acting boss for about a year um, after he had some health problems and the current head of the family was said to have taken over in 1998. Now, that's not to say Dom Cirillo left his life in the mob. He just took on a little bit smaller role in the family. He was an older man. At that point, he took on a uh, consigliere type of role. But in 2004, um, actually before Dom was indicted for the last time, there would be an infamous event that would set up. Um, Dominic Cirillo had a son, Nicholas Cirillo. And it was said that by this point, their relationship had become very frayed. Nicholas Cirillo was an associate of the Genovese family and other families, but he was a drug addict. Uh, he had a drug problem, and Dom Cirillo kind of washed his hands. They were not close. They were not, uh, you know, the typical father and son. And in 2004, Dominic Cirillo's wife would report him missing after he was last seen in a city island, the Bronx, a real estate office. Now, it would be uncovered years later that he actually would get into a fight um, involving the Bonanno crime family. Vincent Basciano, by this point, uh, was locked away. But at the, on that day in 2004, uh, the uh, younger Cirillo's son would get into an argument with Vincent Basciano Jr. and Dominic Cicchelli. Both of these individuals uh, were uh, made members in the Bonanno crime family, and one was obviously the son uh, of the boss at that point. So you're not going to you know, get into an argument and this just nothing happens. Uh, ultimately, he would be reported missing and he would turn up dead. The real question was, who would kill the son of Dom Cirillo? Dom Cirillo was a known entity in the mafia. People knew who he was. He was an old school guy. You're not going to just going to kill him and get away with it. Nothing ultimately would turn up, though. And people wondered, why isn't Cirillo doing anything about this? Now, ultimately, as we know, Joseph, uh, Big Joey Messino, uh, would cooperate as the boss of Bonato family. He would set up Bacciano to indeed go to prison. And in one of those prison tapes where uh, Joey Messino wore the wire, he would actually ask Vincent Bacciano about, you know, what happened with the kid? What happened with the kid? Did we have anything to do with that? Bacciano would respond, quote, that came from Dom. That came from Dom, meaning in his testimony, Messina would basically detect that that meant that Dominic Cirillo likely ordered uh, the hit on his own son. Now, it's important to understand Dom Cirillo never was brought a case on involving this, um, but the streets have talked and the streets have mentioned this. This would be discussed in Joe Messino's testimony. Now, in 2004, Dom Cirillo would take one more pinch. He would be jammed up in a racketeering beef and get four years in prison. He'd be released in 2008. Now, keep in mind, Dom Cirillo is still alive 
at the age of 1992. That's a pretty updated picture of Quiet Dom. He was said to always be a very low-key individual. He never was flashy. He lived in a very small, nondescript home. Um, and he's one of those old-school Cosa Nostra guys. There's not many made more uh, than him in Cosa Nostra currently. And once he passes away, he'll truly be one of the last of the Mohicans. Um, an early boxer who struggled but made the right friendship. Cosa Nostra is all about connections, and Dom Cerullo had plenty of them in his life. We could ultimately say, though, in his late twilight years, he may have been the unthinkable. He may have had his own son killed. We'll never know. Dom Cerullo, a name you have to know. We'll be back next week with another episode of Sit Down Shorts. As I said, please make sure you hit the like button and subscribe.